We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We really do appreciate being your ears of the night and your voice of the night. We thank you so much. We want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Let's get to it. The unbiased UFO report. Yes, it's that time of the night again where we bring in John Hudson. We call him Stetson John around here because he always wears a black Stetson, and it looks damn good on him. It really, really does. John is always up to date on what is happening around the UFO world, keeping all of you in the know of what's happening. He's like our personal TMZ reporter when it comes to UFOs. John, always a pleasure to have you. (laughs) Happy to be here, Dave. I, I'm not sure how I feel about that about that comparison, but uh, I'll take whatever I can get at this point. <laughs> uh, it was the first thing that came to my mind. I'm not going to lie; it was the first thing that came to oh, my mind. That was mind. awesome. No, that was awesome. No, doing well, Dave. Happy to be here, uh, man. What a show! Love that guest. He, he was awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah, Gilman's yeah. Good guy. Good guy. Yeah, no, it, it's uh things are. It's funny, you know, because I was on this uh, panel with you on Friday, and everyone was talking about July being a slow month. And it kind of cracked me up because, I mean, you know, we've had more stories than we've have been able to even cover. So things are chugging but, along. But, but it really hasn't been like the month of July, now that we're out of it, really wasn't a hard hitting news month of of a. it wasn't like July where it was like every day there was something new being reported on. You know, it was a lot of a lot of uh, conjecture going on, drama. If we could use the word drama, I mean, probably the most exciting part was Avi Loeb, the Harvard professor setting up the Galileo project, yep. which I think is going to be absolutely incredible if they yeah. can get the proper funding for it. But uh, let's move on here in regards to uh, what you bring for us tonight, John, because yep, you yep. know you want to start off with a correction uh, that uh, – you oh made yes, boo boo with last week. Yeah, j- just a, just a quick correction. Um, you know, I, and it partly was my own fault for for doing kind of guesswork. Um, but basically, when we were talking about, um, uh, and I don't remember identifying him as lieutenant or or commander, but he is actually a rank commander now. Um, when we were talking about um, Commander Chad and uh, Underwood, and uh, we you asked me about uh, his time in the service, and uh, he specifically said. Um, that I that I I didn't take uh, good enough notes on that he a- actually had been in 21 years almost to the day of his interview with Jeremy Corbell and that of that 21 years about the last 10 he'd done in the reserves but um so basically that's about a, about 11 years active and about 10 years reserve and um but he reserve as a civilian employee so he's he's you know he's pretty close to still you know active uh, from that point of view um but yeah but 21 years in the service so definitely um uh, hats off to him and, and much respect now let's talk about this bomb that he dropped that really caused david Beatty, who's been a, a guest on this show uh made him kind of retract a little bit yeah so you know honestly i I, I love the way this worked out. I think it was a really healthy um, a healthy response all the way around. I, I'm a little bummed it happened to Dave because he's a really nice guy. He's a little on the outside of the community. He did a beautiful video, and it was kind of unfortunate that it fell in his lap. But essentially what happened was, was that uh, Commander Underwood um, clarified that the, that the section of this, um, this um, 14-page report that had been done by the Navy um, back in... I believe it was. Two, I believe it was done, or at least it was started in 2009. I don't know when it was completed, and I don't really know who actually got a hold of it and and exactly how Dave did because that's not a public report. But anyway, Dave basically relied very heavily on that report for putting together that video. He did also talk to people, but he really kind of used that report as his kind of guiding post. And what he found out from Underwood was that the section of the report that was attributed to Underwood. Uh, Underwood did not say 
uh, he was actually never even interviewed for that report. Um, he, he had no input to it at all. And so this brings in some kind of unfortunate, startling questions like, you know, well, then who did write it? Who wrote that section? Why was it attributed to Underwood when it wasn't him? Could, should it have just been misattributed to someone else? Or was it completely fabricated? And so this, you know, and this happens. I mean, the, the, we, you know, we didn't, the, this report was never officially released. So it's hard to, to, to really know how, how solid it was to begin with, but puts Dave in a horrible position where, you know, now he, he not only has to retract the, the aspects of that, his video that relied on, on that specific portion of the text. But if the writer of that report was willing to fabricate that section, it now throws everything else in the report into question as well. And so for Dave, it means a, a, some egg on his face and uh, a lot of legwork if he wants to then go back and, and, and you know, readdress the video correctly. But the thing I will say is that right when it came out, Dave was right out there on Twitter, made a made a really nice message saying that, you know, he was very sorry about, oh, sorry, 13 page summary, um, you know, that there, there was fabrication and errors and many of the statements in the film uh, are, are attributed to that doc and, and those interviews. And so he was very quick to apologize. The thing I loved was how much support he got from UFO Twitter. Um, people responding with, hey, man, don't worry about it. It happens to all of us, you know. You know, no harm, no foul. You know, thanks for being upfront about it. I mean, everyone was, everyone was, he, Dave was much harder himself than anyone else was. And so between Dave calling it up real quick and everyone's very supportive response, I thought it was handled really well, but it is a very unfortunate, you know, set of circumstances for Dave because he did a beautiful video and now he has to put his sources into question. Yeah, and that's always the chance you take when you're relying heavily on sources. It doesn't matter whether it's this show, whether you are creating videos or talking to people. You want to make sure that you are getting the proper information out there. And, you know, the way this society works today in the news cycle where you, you, everybody's trying to be first, everybody is trying to get that information out, you know, sometimes accuracy fails on that. And it's happening in, in all sorts of mainstream media. And that's basically started happening a number of years ago when Twitter became the forefront of getting news out quickly and breaking news out quickly. And could it be something that it fell in the lines of that because of uh, the pressure there was to try and bring something out? Well, that's what was interesting was that was it I don't know how many people were paying this much attention. There were actually a lot of differences between Dave's first video and the most recent one he released later on. He went through several iterations of that video where he was making corrections where people were calling him up and saying, Oh, I was actually this guy, and it actually went like this. And so he actually went through several, you know, versions of it and it got tighter and tighter and more accurate, we thought, as time went on. So Dave was putting in a lot of legwork to make sure. I think that's why he's so upset because he he really did put a lot of work in to make this to make that video accurate and um and and it, you know this this really blindsided him blindsided all, uh, blindsided everybody. No kidding. Let's move on to another one here, uh, George Knapp from KLAS TV in Las Vegas, and really Mr. UFO when it comes to reporting this in the mainstream. He has his own news wire called the Mystery Wire. And they were able to coax another Bob Lazar witness to come out in public and talk about Lazar being the real deal. So who is TJ Janazzo? Uh, well, th thank you. You know, I was I was kind of playing with the pronunciation myself. Um, uh, so um, first of all, I encourage everyone to go on to, to YouTube or Mystery Wire and watch the videos yourself. There's, there's four of them. Uh, they're very, very entertaining and very interesting. Um, he is a retired police officer who um, was not only working um, in the uh, in the court system when Bob Lazar was um, in trouble for the pandering charges, but it turns out he was uh, a real confidant of George Knapp at the time and actually provided uh, George with a tremendous amount of assistance during that entire fiasco, um, it, including kind of, you know, helping advise um uh, you know, um, uh, Bob Lazar on, on, you know, how much, you know, trouble he was really in and, you know, why it was so important to play by the rules and, and, and admit to, to what he'd done. And, uh, and so this guy's a, um, you know, he, he's, he's someone who, who had an interest in UFOs to begin with. 
Um, but he was really a, a, a confidant of George's. And so, uh, you know, you get to hear some interesting inside stories. And um, and specifically, I don't know if you guys all remember, but there was a specifically disturbing um, story that, that George Knapp told about a woman who was going forward with a witness who then told that, uh, you know, that it, it's really easy for people to get lost in the desert and was was really threatened and, and was scared and wouldn't talk to George anymore. Well, it turned out this was this guy's friend. Uh, this was a woman that worked with TJ in, in his office. And he talks about how it wasn't just that she shut down George after that. She shut down everything after that. She basically wouldn't talk about any of this, these topics at all and, and really kind of avoided TJ after that. And he, and he said her whole personality changed after that event. They really scared her. Yeah. And, you know, according to this, what, what makes this guy believe that Lazar is the real deal? Well, it's it's not so much that um, that you know he um, you know that he has any direct evidence to say you know yes you know Bob was telling the truth. It's it's more that he is able to fill in a lot of the gaps in the story, and he is a, certainly his own personal character evaluation of Bob because Bob is someone he interacted with quite a bit, and so he he does talk about that, and he is able to confirm. Um, you know, a couple of things. And the one thing that was was especially interesting was that there was two men that showed up to pressure the, the judge in the case to give a stricter sentence to Bob Lazar. The judge refused to do so. But what's interesting was and what was not released until today, until this interview came out, was that many, many years later, TJ was actually at Nellis Air Force Base in the office of the JAG where he always had to check in with whenever he was on base. And while sitting in that office, one of those two gentlemen that pressured the federal, the, pr pressured the judge actually came out of an office and walked by him and they made eye contact. So whoever one of these two guys was, he's someone who actually works in and around the JAG office um, uh, at Nellis Air Force Base. So that's a very, very interesting tie into all of it. No kidding. No kidding. And for people who don't know, I mean, there is very minimal distance between downtown Las Vegas, Las Vegas Boulevard, and the beginnings of Nellis Air Force Base, oh, which which yeah. starts to open up into the range where, you know, you go a couple hours north and that's where you get into the deep stuff with Area 51. Yep, absolutely. No, if you go to any of the racing schools, I went to a, a, an open world racing school in Vegas and the strip of land they're on is right across the road from the beginning of Nellis Air Force Base. And so it's, it's Bob Wire and you can see planes right over right over the other side of the road. It's right there on the edge of the city. Yeah, that's just amazing. Well, you know what? We'll soon see. I mean, I mean, sure, this this doesn't give us more clarity about Bob Lazar, but it gives us uh, some added perspective. You know, I think we're all still waiting for someone to come out from Area 51 and say, I worked with Bob Lazar at Area 51 or at S4. I doubt that person will ever come forward, but it, it does give you hope that this story after 32 years still is not dead in the water and that there is more material to present. Okay, finally tonight with you, we are going to get into... Katie and the alien from Roswell. Now, this goes back to our guest, Katie Grabowski, that we had on last week. This, this is this. I don't know if you were prepared for this when you when you were going to interview her, but um, this was just the coolest thing to come out of of any interview that I haven't expected in a long time. And basically, Katie, who's a who's a a, a very good investigator on her own, basically um, had been curious about some rumors that have been going around for a long time that one of the bodies from Roswell had ended up in Denver. And it so happened that in her investigate that a couple from California reached out to her because um, that gentleman's father was a mortician in Denver. And so she ended up um, getting to interview that mortician, um, I believe two or three times, she said, before he, he did pass away. And basically, and you should listen to, to the interview you, you, that Dave did with her, but basically, the, to make a long story short, this... Um, this this mortician found a safe in the basement, found out it had been um, had a stay on it by a, by a federal judge, uh, opened it anyway, um, thought that he found a small child. Um, only many years later, um, while uh, uh, paragliding, I believe it was, or or um, or hang gliding uh, in, in New Mexico, did he then pick in that it, it might have been in, uh, something other than human? 
And uh, in the in the uh, in the in Katie's effort of this of uh, of investigating all this, she was giving a talk about it at a um, at a re at, at a home, um, uh, you know, for for older individuals, and mentioned the fact that the federal judge had passed away. And someone in the audience said, "Oh, well, you know, his uh, his widow is up on the fifth floor. Would you like us to go get her?" And so she actually ended up meeting with the widow. So she's met with the widow of the federal judge who put the stay on the safe. And she was able to interview the mortician that sneaked a peek at it. And on top of all of it, she hinted that she might actually know where the thing is currently resting. So it's it was one hell of a story and something that I think we're all going to be very, very excited to follow as, as Katie proceeds down this investigative path. Do you think that... You know, I mean, now we're going on hearsay, though. That's the problem. As these stories get long in the tooth, the people start dying off, and we're having to go by second-rate reports here. Is, is that still going to be valid in a story like Roswell? It depends. Um, if if they don't ever find any physical evidence, then it's just a really good story. And it is. It's a good story. I mean, you got, everyone should really go back and listen to it when, when Katie tells it. It's a fun story and it's an interesting story. And it's the kind of story that I like because you have you have uh, separate pieces of seemingly mundane information that then when you put them together, you suddenly realize it's something very significant. And, and, and those are the kind of those are the kind of stories I like to follow. Um, but I agree with you um, up until this point. It is it is, you know, essentially hearsay. However, um, if if Katie is able to find a an actual, you know, an actual body or even um, a, a location where it's very obvious that a body had been kept for some period of time, that brings a, a, a whole new level of, um, of of seriousness to the story. Wow. That's going to be amazing. My friend, thank you for a great night of reports. We'll talk to you in two nights time. My pleasure. Thank you much. You have a good evening. All right, let's get to the news.